Hey, everybody. We're here with the Dirt Trail Running Podcast, Coffee with Coaches. I'm Coach Loretta, and I'm here with Coach Reese. Hello. Hey. So how are things going, Reese? They're going pretty good. I just got back from a run this morning. Um, my girlfriend and I went to Vegas for my sister's wedding this past weekend. Um, feeling a little tucker just because it's kind of the biggest, like, training, like, week before I have um, a 50-mile and 100-mile coming up. But besides that, coming off of travels got me a little bit, uh, a little bit tuckered too. So I, you know, I want to like call back to a couple podcasts ago. I want to say it was maybe like two months ago, like how to determine like when you should be feeling kind of tired from your training. And I'm kind of like right at that spot where it's like, yeah, I'm feeling kind of tired. I can still run. I can still hit my marks, but it's okay because I know that I'm in the thick of my training. This is the right, biggest week right. I have. I should feel like I'm kind of pushing myself. And then I have a good couple weeks of freshening back up for my races. So um, I'm feeling pretty good. Feeling, feeling like I'm hitting my marks. How about you? It's good. Hey, I'm coming around. You know, I've been working through niggles for months um, and I'm starting to feel like myself again, which is super exciting. I've got my longest long run in on Saturday since June. So, and that went pretty well. And, you know, I just am slowly being very careful and, and increasing my mileage and hoping to be able to get in some speed um and some tempo here soon but i've been just really being cautious <laughs> but but starting to feel like my old self so which is exciting <laughs> it's been a long wait so today we're going to talk about one of my favorites that's near and dear to my heart is the hennepin 100. so hennepin 100 was my first 100 and and reese has his hennepin shirt on and i have my cherry pop shirt on <laughs> so it it was um I say one of the best days of my life, right? I went out and ran my first hundred, not knowing what I could do, if I could finish. Um, you know, there was a lot of emotion going into the race. I remember going to the uh, race meeting and that year, Ann Trayson was there and was a speaker, which I was super excited about, you know, somebody that I really respect um, as an elite runner. And I was sitting at a table with a couple of guys had never met and that were, um, has, had done some ultras and they were talking about it and they were saying things. I don't know if they were in meaning to scare me, but they were starting to terrify me. <laughs> and um, I'm like, okay, I, you know, I'm just gonna like, and I, I had in my mind what my race plan was. And I think they thought I was crazy, but I just kind of kept it to myself <laughs> and, and went with it, but it, it was fun. And I was super excited for the day to start. And it was just magical for me. I felt like, wow. I get a day where I get to run all day, what I love, do what I love and be taken care of all day long. So um, my husband, Derek was the um, crude and that was, you know, our first ultra. So we learned a lot. Um, my son Riley came and he ran, he was supposed to run a few legs with me and ended up running like 25 miles, um, which was the most he'd ever ran in his life. Um, my friend, Teddy came. Um, he actually was in a uh, coaching cross country at the time and he drove eight hours to come down to hear me say I was done and I was in a walk the last 20 <laughs> and uh, which didn't isn't how it played out but that's how I felt at that moment and then my friend Jenny ran um some some miles with me so it was uh super fun you know to have that first experience at Hennepin because I, I tell everybody like the aid stations are amazing. You you get there and you're looking forward to what's going to, what are you going to see at the next aid station and keep pulling you along. It was just incredible. So I'm excited to talk about Hennepin. Oh, wonderful. And you know, maybe I should share my Hennepin story too. I, um, so I went out to run Wasatch um, last year in September. It was, it was September 9th or something like that. Um, and ended up making it about 60 miles dropped with altitude sickness um, and exhaustion, um, went back to the house and was like, I don't feel like I've like gotten my like performance out of all the training that I put in. So I contacted Michelle, I got into the 50. Um, and then three weeks later, it was October 1st and we were running the 50 and I wanted to go for a nice flat, fast 50. Um, was lining up against uh, Phil Young, who I'd never met before, but I've heard stories of his, his amazing leg speed, um, which definitely like he, he definitely toyed around with that field today. Uh, or uh, last year, which was great. Um, learned a lot of lessons just in pacing and how to run that 50. Um, but it was a cool dichotomy of like training for the mountains. And then like, okay, we have a couple weeks to like tune up for a 50 mile race. Um, so that was my first like flat and fast 50. I've run a couple 50s before, but um, you know, the real flat races definitely 
toy around with you differently than going out and doing a trail race. So I'm glad that we're talking about it today because I do think that there's things that people can prepare for um, better for the flat races as opposed to the trail races. So I'm excited to dive into that. Right. And you know, I'm glad you mentioned that Reese, because I hear a lot of times people will say, oh, it's a flat race. It's an, like kind of an easy hundred. Well, for one, I don't think there's a much such thing as an easy hundred and with flat comes different challenges than with trail, you know, right. So um, I think training for race specificity is super important when we're thinking about this flat fast course. Um, what I did learn was that, you know, the more I was running on flats, my body, you know, adapted to be able to handle that. When you're thinking about running a hundred miles on what's almost a, just a straight flat course is uh, you're using the same muscles the entire day. You know, you're not getting that uphill, downhill, maybe a little bit with the road crossings, but for the most part, it's that exact same muscle use all day long. So you want to be prepared for that going into that race for sure. I completely agree with that. And for the people that can't see that are listening on the podcast, like I was shaking my head up and down for everything that you were saying. Um, like any race is going to be the toughest race if you give it your all. It doesn't matter if it's a 50 mile, a hundred mile, a flat course, a mountain course, a, a one mile race in 800, whatever it is. If you give it your all, you're going to be pushing up against your limit, which is always tough because nobody ever pushes their limits feeling like it's easy. So, um, of course, you know, like mountains are, um, something that everybody looks at as just monoliths and megaliths like in the environment. And it's cool to say that we tackle those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, like a 50 mile race can't be an extremely tough and competitive race in and of itself with different challenges. So I don't think one is better than the other. I don't think one is more challenging than the other, but like we've been mentioning, like they have their, they have their place and they have their, their, their strengths and weaknesses and, and, and challenges and whatnot. So um, yeah. before we get into like the training, do you kind of want to talk about just the field really quickly and highlight some individuals? We won't go too into depth with like an analysis um, of the race because um, Hennepin's always great because it is so variable with you have dark horses that come in, you have speedsters that everybody knows that come in. Um, so we're just going to highlight a couple people um, to keep your eye on and some of our athletes that are going to be racing that we're super proud of. So do you want to kick it off? Loretta? For sure. So, you know, I'm just looking at this 100 field real quick, and we have Juan Moran, which was one of our coaches back before um, you started. And so it's uh, nice to see that he's going to be at, back out there and racing, and I hope he has a really great race. That's in the 100. Um, th that's a name that I'm familiar with. Do you have somebody else in that 100? Oh, yeah, that you wanted to point out. I think you do. Brian? Yeah, so, so Corey Logsdon, um, you yeah. know, I've, I've raced with him. I've raced against him. Um, he's awesome. He's got so many finishes. He's got a ton of experience. He's um, definitely like a hundred mile specialist. So he's going to be somebody to, to look out for, for sure. I want to say to Juan Moran, I, I met him at Earth Day, the 50K. He came in, I want to say, oh my gosh, I think he was second behind me. Um, and he is just the nicest guy. He came in with minimal training and wrecked that course. Um, so I'm really excited to see him at Hennepin um, 100, just kind of like lay it down on the line. Um, but otherwise I have a personal athlete. Uh, his name is rich. He's going to be going in for his first hundred miler. He's been training his butt off. He is ready. He's stoked. He's always putting out good energy. Anybody that's friends with him on Facebook or Instagram or just friends with him in general knows that like, he's just a positive energy in the field for sure. Um, I also see that Rachel Raguna is in there. Um, she was sec or first female, second overall in 2021, I believe, at Cuddle 100. So she's definitely one to keep an eye out for. And I yep. have um, Aaron Dial will be coming in to do her 100. Um, she's had some setbacks with some injuries over the last few years, and she's come back, ran a really solid 100K at Kettle. So I'm really excited to see what she can do and possibly a podium spot for her at um, Hennepin. And I also see that Coach Madeline is in the 100 as well. Good. Speaking of um, Kettle, uh, Brian Simonic is going to be um, running in Hennepin 100 too. He, um, you know, came in second this past year at uh, Kettle Moraine, which was his first 100-mile race. I want to say he was in the, ooh, I want to say he was in the early 16s. So early 16s for like a first 100-mile race is absolutely dynamite. Um, so good luck to Brian. He's gonna like, hopefully he crushes him and I are, um, both friends on Facebook and Instagram. And, um, I know he's got a couple, a uh, couple goals up on his plate and he, uh, he's looking for big things out of Hennepin. So 
I'm excited to see him, uh, you know, lay it out there. But nice. otherwise, um, for the 50 mile, um, there is going to be a good showdown between Taggart Van Etten and Phil Young. They're both um, extremely um, passionate and they're both extremely familiar with the 50 and 100 mile flat specialty. Um, they've actually been training together too. They just went on a monster training run probably like a week and a half ago or so. It was about like 36, 37 miles or so at like a 640 pace, 637, something like that. Um, so Taggart has been putting up like 140 mile weeks for the past like eight weeks. He's been doing nothing but training. Um, his training looks super solid. Phil has been hovering in like the 80s, 90s, um, touching up towards 100s, but just absolutely laying down the speed. Um, both of them, I, I don't know Taggart personally, um, but I've heard that he's just an amazing guy and he's super humble and he's always willing to go out of his way to talk to people. Um, you know, like I said, I, I raced against Phil um, and I'm hoping him the best because he's super nice. He's super humble, um, super funny, too. He's just got one of those personalities where it's he's like hilarious. you just want to like keep an eye on him. He's always doing something quirky. <laughs> Um, so his Instagram peanut butter sandwiches, well. peanut butter jelly, uh, what are those called? Uh, Uncrustables <laughs> are his thing. <laughs> so, and he's got a couple good podcasts out and so does Taggart, um, just detailing like their Hennepin and their Tunnel Hill experience. Um, so they're actually going to both be racing at Tunnel Hill later this year. So it's going to be interesting to just kind of follow this, uh, this fall racing schedule here and see, uh, you know, who comes out at fifth at the 50 at Hennepin and then what happens in the hundred mile, um, in Tunnel Hill because there's only about a month in between. So it'd be cool to see how both of them recover, um, you know, and then just personally me with a stake in the game, it's kind of interesting to see where their 50 miles end up for, uh, you know, for for me and my competitive nature. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, but other than that, uh, we do have another athlete of mine. His name is, um, his name is Dylan Bargett. He's going to be racing the 50. He just did his first 50K uh, earlier this year, and he absolutely crushed it. I mean, he, he placed really well. Um, so he's going in with high hopes in the 50. Um, and him, too, like, he's just a super positive guy. He's a super positive spirit. Um, wish him nothing but the best. He's, just, he's a Chicagolander, um, resides in Chicago. So um, he's definitely used to running the lake path and getting that, that, that flat leg speed going. Um, so yeah, he's, he's definitely going to have a good time on that. But, um, other than that, is there anybody else that you want to mention Loretta? Um, well, I'm looking at the 50 K and I have an athlete that will be doing her first ultra Janine Anderson. So, and she's, uh, has some speed. So it will be interesting to see how the day plays out for her. And I see, it looks like Matt coach Matt is also in on the 50 K this year. So, um, and I'm sure we've missed some other great people in there too, but as a, just a quick, you know, run, it's going to be a great field. It's going to be exciting to watch. Um, I will be curious to see how it plays out with Tagger and Phil. Um, a couple of years ago, they ran pretty much side by side at Tunnel Hill 100, the year that Phil won the first year. So it will be interesting how, how that goes. Are they going to, are they going to run it together? Or are they going to, you know, actually compete? Okay. So Loretta, I'm on ultra sign up right now and I'm looking at the 50 K and I see uh, Coach Matt, Coach Matt Hassan, and I'm looking at the 50 mile, and I also see Coach Matt Hassan. Oh, maybe that maybe is interesting. I wonder if he's actually going to race. I don't know. Maybe he's doubling. So you know, the 50 50k is a night run. It starts at 5 p.m. So yeah. maybe he's thinking he's going to do both. We're going to have to ask him on that. that. That's a good question because you know what? I thought I had saw him on another one too. And then I thought, no, I must've, I, I went back and forth a couple of times myself. So let's see what we're going to have to check and see what Matt is doing. It's, so a it's great field. <laughs> yeah. So a great field coming up. Um, And the other cool thing about Hennepin and I'm just going to share is that they have um, Michelle Hartwig of Ornery Mill Racing always has every detail in place for races, really cool swag, excellent aid stations, just the support all around is amazing. But I'm just going to share real quick the buckle that I got um, for the year that my I ran. It's super cool. So if you're out there, go for the buckle. It's, it's probably my favorite buckle that I have. And the year um, I ran, I also got a really cool trophy. Um, the trophies are different this year, but this was, I was second place overall female. So you can kind of see if you're if you're watching, you can see the what it actually looks like. So, yeah. So the race actually starts in Sterling, 
um, Illinois, and it's a point-to-point -point race. So that means it starts in one spot and, in, and it finishes in the other, and it finishes in Kelowna, which, you know, in Kelowna, there is a lot of support with the firefighter, you know, the fire station's open for people to go in and take showers. And it's just the whole community is really supportive of this event, which is also really cool. And it's on a rail trail that goes along the Hennepin Canal. And it's beautiful. I mean, there's the, there's some beautiful locks that you are across, going across. You see the water on one side and, you know, it's fall. So there's some fall colors going on. Um, I, I think it's a beautiful course. Anything um, that you remember about the course that stands out? I mean, you know, when you're running so fast, maybe you didn't notice. <laughs> no, so yeah, there's definitely <laughs> points where you zone out for sure. But um, for the most part, I, I remember it very well because um, it is it is beautiful. Um, it is flat, it is fast. Um, the first few miles are gonna be concrete. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a paved portion of the trail. You transition onto like that crushed limestone. A um, couple things to note are that there's like some of those like thicker green walnuts that are the size of like baseballs, a um, little bit smaller. Those will be in some spots. I mean, there was only a handful of spots I remember where I was like, ooh, I have to like alter my stride a little bit to get over them. Um, so I want to say for like 98% of the race, like you're not really going to have to worry about it, but just be careful of those little land landmines. Um, sure. The year that I did it last year, uh, it was really sunny outside. So I think, um, you know, a good tip would be, even if you wear a hat, like wear some sunglasses. Um, I wore a hat last year and it definitely gets, it protects you from the sun coming, coming down, but it doesn't protect you from the sun that's reflecting off of the water. So we'll have to kind of keep, eye on the conditions and see see what's going to be going on um yeah. but other than that like you're oh, what was that go ahead go ahead sorry i was gonna say other than that um you're following the canal and for the most part it is like a very gradual downhill when you first start now i only ran the 50 so when i go back and i look at my strava it's like you have this initial like kind of like 20 or 30 foot like you drop down over the span of a couple miles so you don't even really feel it um but other than that, like it's it's basically flat until you get to the bottom part of the T where the 50 mile splits off, and then the 100 mile keeps uh, keeps going west. Um, so I want to say in the 50 mile, it was about 400 feet of elevation gain. So that works out to be like you know less than 10 foot per mile on average. So that's basically just the only elevation is going to be when you're hitting those road crossings which um, you and I were talking before the podcast uh, can be deceptive because your legs get so used to one rhythm. You hit one of those road crossings and although it's not really a hill, although it's not a mountain, you got to lift your knee up just a little bit higher. And it's like, Ooh, this, this is interesting. For sure, um, so for sure. Those are something to note too. And I guess too, that's just another reason why I think hill training, even for flat races is super important because no matter how flat we think a race is like, we're going to have to draw up our knees at some point whether that's to get up a curb, around a log, whatever it is. So um, for everybody that's been including a little bit of hills in their training, um, I think you have a leg up. I'm just not letting those, uh, those, those tiny little bumps get you down. Um, I remember when I was running, I kind of, you know, whenever, whenever I would hit those, I would think, oh my God, I've been cruising at like seven minutes a mile. And now I'm like at eight minutes a mile. And then to get back into that rhythm again, once you kind of go down on the other side, it just kind of, it's a little interrupter that you, like mentally going in if you mentally know that like hey i'm gonna hit this i'm gonna have to slow down a little bit it can definitely help you out instead of discouraging you right right i agree and you know it does it changes your pace just a little bit it changes your rate of perceived exertion um especially when i noticed it was later in the race when i was getting you know past 75 miles 80 miles mm -hmm. they were it was becoming pretty fatiguing to you know go down and around those those so so yeah so they're definitely there i was going to go back on the weather you know the year i ran it um in 2018 the weather was to me perfect you know it was um kind of cool misty rain um throughout the day so i just had a little light jacket which i like to pack in my in my vest which i can pull out and take you know in and out as much as i want to it's really light and it was probably like maybe 40 degrees. I mean, it was a great day, but then I also, um, paced my, um, an athlete, uh, two years ago, I believe. And it was very hot. So, you know, I, it, you know, by 20 miles, I had all of my athletes, you know, really struggling with the heat. So I don't know what that day will be bring, but be prepared for all weather. You know, it's fall, it's, it's the Midwest. It's hard to say what kind of weather we might have. So, you know, thinking about, 
uh, cooling strategies might still be in, in the realm of that race. I know the day, the year I paced, it got up in the eighties. It was hot, you know, so that was, that was absolutely my experience last year. It, um, you know, we started and I was kind of the oddball because I had like shorts on and no shirt. And like, I was kind of shivering at the start. And then by the time I get going, like I'm fine. But then my race ended at about like, I want to say like 1 PM or somewhere around there. And it was a good, like almost 80 degrees. It was 78 and um, fairly humid for the day. I remember it wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but um, yeah, if you're running the hundred mile, you know, you're starting in that, you know, 40, I think it was like 45 at the start. It was a crazy, like 30 degree spread. Um, but you're starting in like, you know, it, what could be 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees. We don't really know because it's fall, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and you could be going up and touching 80 and then coming all the way back down and going back to 40. Yes. So I yes. think, you know, 40 isn't terrible itself. 80 isn't terrible itself. But when you go from one to the other and then back, just being in the heat all day, getting exposure to the elements, there's not a ton of foliage on the trail. Like there is, I mean, you're going to get some like tree coverage and whatnot, but if it is sunny outside, you're going to get some sun exposure. So by the time you hit that and then go back into the night, especially since nights are coming at us a little bit uh, sooner than in the middle of summer, like, you know, 60 degrees, 50 degrees feels a lot colder after you've been exposed all day for sure. I agree. I, so I feel like it's really smart. I'm, I'm a big advocate for dressing in layers. You know, you might start out with the shorts in the tank, with maybe some sleeves, maybe a light jacket, th you know, thrown in your pack or some gloves and a hat, um, just like a thin hat are good things to have. And then thinking about, like we said, you know, it gets hot and then it gets cold. And when it gets cold, you most likely are moving slower because now you're later in that race. So even a quick pair of um, pants to cover up, if you know you're really moving slow, it might be something to do. And I'm a big believer at the finish line to have a nice warm hoodie and some, you know, warm pants because you feel like, you know, you're sweaty and now you're stopping and now you're freezing. So, you know, just be prepared for that, I think. And then, um, you know, also be prepared on all realms of cooling or heating because it could go either way. But I believe if it's anything over like 65, you want to be thinking about cooling. Maybe an um, you want to throw in an ice bandana or maybe you want to have some sleeves that you can wet down at aid stations to keep yourself cool during that part portion of the day, but then be prepared to add some layers as the day goes on. For sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a great description of the course. Uh, mo most of it's going to be that crushed limestone like we were talking, but um, since we kind of have this idea of the course, like, you know, one of the hot button, uh, you know, questions of discussion is going to be what shoes do you wear? Do you wear trail shoes? Do you wear road shoes? Um, I've gotten that question myself a bunch. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this beforehand. And I guess my idea of like using trail shoes, I, I, I would use a trail shoe when I need more traction, when I'm going uphill or downhill and there's curves and we know there's going to be dirt or maybe there's some loose mud for sure. You want some deep lugs so that way it grips into the trail. Um, so that way you can ascend, descend, bank around turns and whatnot. But with this course, if you're in the 50 mile race, you have one turn. And then if you're in the hundred mile race, I think you have like one or two turns. So regardless, you're going to be going straight for a while. Um, so I don't think, you know, you're not going uphill too hard. You're not going downhill too hard. You're not banking too hard you can absolutely get away with a road shoe. And it might even behoove you just because the beginning part of the race is, um, is, is so, uh, so concrete, -y, so asphalt. -y. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, I think that like trail shoes would be optional in this case, if they're your most favorite pair of shoes, if they're your favorite color and they work for you and you know, all, all that, and they feel good, you know, they're going to last the distance. That's awesome. Then maybe pack some other shoes, like just in case. Um, but I know that at like, Hennepin and at like, you know, Tunnel Hill is basically like a, a similar style of trail. Um, a lot of people will be wearing carbon plated shoes just because they're going to be going faster and um, there's nothing really too technical about the trail. Right. Yep. I agree. I would definitely recommend wearing tr um, just road shoes. I think that they are perfectly fine. I would rather be on a road shoe on something that's flat like that than having the lugs to feel under my feet all day. Um, so, so that's what I would suggest. The other question I hear a lot is gators or no gators. In my experience, the times that I've been on the trail, I have not used gators and I've not had any issue. Um, so I personally would not wear them. I would just go with what's lighter. And that's just the, you know, the way I feel more comfortable. Um, if you have a guest shoe with big, big mesh holes and you're worried about some of those pebbles getting in, I suppose you could um, wear the gators, but I'm not sure that they're necessarily needed on this course. What, what's your experience with that, Reese? 
I think that's a great rule of thumb for everybody. I think like the variables that, you know, would, would go into my determination would be like how dusty is the trail? How easily can, um, can the trail get kicked up? In this case, I don't think it's too dusty. I don't think the rocks can get kicked up too much. But I think the other biggest variable is that like, um, if you're planning on changing your shoes at any point, it makes shoe changes a little bit tougher, you know? Um, I've heard, you know, some people, they, um, their first pair of shoe can have a gaiter and their second shoe is not set up for a gaiter. There's always ways to modify your shoes so that way you can put a gaiter on a, on a shoe that's not like adjusted for it. Um, but in that case, like if you forget that, like, oh yeah, like not every shoe can, can even support a gaiter, um, then you might find yourself in some hot water. So if you plan on changing your shoes once or twice or three times, um, you know, you can definitely shave off some, some free time, just not having to worry about your gaiters. Um, so in this case, I think that since, you know, rocks and pebbles getting into your shoes are highly unlikely, I think it just saves you time and weight overall. But, um, again, like that's all personal discretion. Some people absolutely hate that one pebble getting into their shoe in that case, like they aren't super heavy, so you can get away yep. with it for the pair. Yeah. Yeah. Another piece of gear um, that got me, of course, this was my first hundred, so I wasn't as experienced, and I, I grabbed my headlamp a little bit too late. So I ended up, you know, having to run a little bit in the dark before I ha was able to get my headlamp. So be thinking about that. Be thinking that t the time changes a little bit sooner in the fall, and so I mean, at the time, the, the darkness comes a little sooner in the fall, and so you're going to want that headlamp, you know, to have with you. So you don't run into not being able to see on the trail because, you know, when we get into these point to point races, you see a lot of people at the finish, but then throughout the race, it, it spreads out quite a bit. So you may be on your own in those dark pieces of the night. Now there is a little bit of an out and back, you know, for the turnaround for the, um, for the hundred. And so you will see some people, you know, coming back that you might meet along the course, but for the most part, it's, you know, pretty spread out. Yep. And I think too, that's, that's a big thing um, is just worrying about the time change because uh, I can't remember exactly when time changes, but I know it's like end of September, right? Like we're coming up. Right. On right. Closer. It's right close to there. Yeah. So, you know, like we're kind of used to it getting dark at about like, you know, seven now, once that time changes, it's going to get dark at six. Um, yeah. So just factor in like how many hours do I plan on being in the dark? So how many batteries do I need to pack? How many headlamps should I have? Um, so I think that would, that'd be absolutely smart. Um, just keep it on the, the gear bandwagon too. Like, what do you think about poles at this race? Oh yeah. So we, we were having that conversation, you know, a little bit ago, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is a course that I would really recommend poles. It's a flat course. There's not going to be any hills up or down hills that you really need that for the advantage. So in my opinion, this is not a course that I would necessarily use it. I have had athletes use them. I think more for mental security than anything. I'm not sure it was something that was to their advantage but what, what's your thoughts on them? Yeah, so um, I, I personally take like a very coop style approach to um, to polls. Anybody that goes onto CTS's website will, or Train Rights website, they'll be able to find a bunch of articles. If you just type in a little search box of polls, you'll see a bunch of poll technique. You'll see a bunch, bunch of poll opinion. Um, so like the long and the short of it is, um, first of all, safety. So, um, you know, this is a pretty, it's not a narrow course, but it's definitely like a smaller course. There's I lost you, Reese. We're going to hold on a second and Reese is going to come back and tell us about polls, but I think he froze. So, so sorry about that. He'll, he'll be back in just a minute. Reese also has a great reel on his um, social media that um, shows an um, example of using polls. So you can also check that out in, while we get Reese patched back in here. And you're on mute, Reese. All right, now we have Reese back. Okay. <laughs> Technology sometimes gets us. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so, you know, my, my coupe style approach, the first thing being safety, um, the, the trail isn't that narrow. It's definitely something that you could fit like, like a, a truck to like a truck and a half on. So you have more than enough room to pass people or to pick an inside line and outside line, whatever it is, dodge some shrubs that might be overgrowing onto the trail. Um, but 
with this start, there's going to be a lot of people around you. So if those polls, you know, um, you know, kind of go awry, um, they're definitely going to be in danger or not endangering, but they're going to be jeopardizing some people's shins, you know? So I think that with the um, amount of people that are on the trail at the start, it's probably not the safest thing for anybody else that's around you. With that being said, if you do choose to use them, like that's not, that's not putting anybody down. That's just a personal opinion that I have. Um, the second thing is going to be what are poles actually used for? Um, so you hear a lot of people say that poles really help spare your legs at the end of a race. Um, so with that being said, the way that they spare your legs is if you're going uphill, they take a little bit of weight and they produce a little bit of power that your legs don't have to produce. If you're going downhill, they can take some of that eccentric contraction by jamming them into the ground that your muscles then don't absorb. Um, or you could use them for technical terrain. Say if there's river crossings and you need just an extra pair of like legs on the ground via the poles to get around some technical terrain. Um, so with that being said, like there are no serious uphills, there's no serious downhills, there's no technical terrain. This is a flat and fast course, whatever, whatever fast means for you. Um, so I think the best way, if we're trying to spare your legs for the end of a race, I think the best way to do that for most people is going to be to implement a walk run program. Um, just because you're going to be taking those breaks, because like we said before, flat races, you're going to be using the same muscles over and over and over again. So, um, if you can run for, you know, 10 minutes and then walk for five minutes and have that like roughly 15 minute interval cycle, um, you know, then you can think, okay, every other walk run, I'm going to take in some fuel. I'm going to make sure my hydration is on point. I'm going to consolidate all my trash. It kind of gives you that mental break of not having to worry about like, go, go, go. And it gives you that those couple minutes to assess and anybody can do any type of amount of time that they would want to. It really comes down to the athlete. Do you want to do five and fives? Do you want to do 10 and fives? Do you want to do 15 fives? Um, I, I think to a certain degree, if you go too small with your walk run interval and you're running the hundred mile race, now you just have too much to think about and too much to worry about because your watch is going to be going off every 10 minutes for, you know, 20 plus hours. Um, so, you know, try to choose a walk run interval that kind of makes sense with your fueling and hydration needs and something that's not too short that you're always looking down to your watch. We're always hearing a buzzer. Um, so I think that would be like a more reasonable way to save your legs for the end of a race come this distance in this, this course. Right. So we might have found something we might be able to disagree on a little bit. <laughs> so as far as the run walk piece, um, I, I, for one, if you're going to be doing the run walk, um, hopefully you've been practicing that in your training, but I think that one that seems to be a common one that is used among a lot of people that are doing hundreds is a three, one, um, three run one minute walk. A lot of people use the, um, I think it's called a gym boss timer. So it's not affecting your watch, not affecting your battery, but it's giving you that notification to run walk. You know, when we're doing a flat race like that, it's nice to have some sort of a, a plan of minutes of how long you're going to walk because in a, a race like a trail race, it's going to kind of guide us with hills and different terrain that, that that we're going to walk because, you know, it's changing our rate of perceived exertion. But in a flat, you know, race like this, we need to come up with a plan. And I think everybody's plan is is a little, you know, different. One can be, depending on, you know, your skill level too and your experience level, one could be longer, like like re, re suggested. You know, it might be done every so often on your fueling times. Maybe it's every fifteen minutes. Maybe it's every thirty minutes. But um, other people have also been really successful with like that three one or four one walk. It kind of goes along with Jeff Galloway's you know training as well. Um, I know Coach Scott also is a pretty big advocate of the three one um, walk ratio. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I mean I think that there are some people that are going to be a little more successful at that shorter shorter run walk. Oh yeah, for sure. And like I mentioned before, it really comes down to the experience and the preference of the athlete. I only mention those longer intervals because that's what I would choose to do. Um, I personally, when I'm running a course, um, I don't like to be looking at my watch all the time. I don't like to be looking at other timers all the time. I don't like to be thinking all the time, you know, yeah. enjoying, the course, enjoying the experience, enjoying how I feel. Um, so for me, those longer run walk intervals um, are more preferred. Now, if yeah. other people with it and they don't mind the, the the beeping going off at certain intervals or the watch buzzing at certain intervals and looking down checking pace looking checking your time 
Um, that's, that's absolutely fine. But again, like you said, try it in training, practice with it. And now is going to be the time to do it. You can still do it in a taper cycle too. You can do it at any point. Um, so, and right now I have a lot of my athletes doing that too. It's just e experimenting, like yeah. try, do you want longer intervals? Do you want shorter intervals? Um, ideally for me, and this is just for me, if you can get everything to line up, then you kind of like have that template in your brain of like, okay, like every two or every three intervals, like I'm going to try to eat something. And it gives you that, like that concrete, then you can just count in your head, you know? Yep, I agree. And I feel like um, I do the same thing. Having uh, athletes kind of experiment with what interval feels good to them, what's too short, what's a little bit too long, so we can kind of fine tune that. And then practicing that because we're using different muscles when we're walking versus when we're running. So we want to make sure we're incorporating that into our training. And I think also a big piece is mindset. Knowing in your head and in your race plan that you're going to do a run walk method is better than, and, and knowing and starting it and implementing it throughout the race, then better than, oh, I have to walk because I have to walk. I'm walking because this is my race day plan. That's going to be a way better, better mental state for you, you know, going in. And it may be that you said in your mind, I'm going to make it to the first two aid stations because I know I can make this comfortably without taxing myself, keeping in that really low zone two. And then um, I'm going to start my run walk. You know, it could be, I'm going to start it right from the very start line. You know, it's what's going to work best for you individually, I think. Yeah. And I think that was like a beautiful um, transition into the mentality of these races is like, you can't think that because it's flat and fast, like I should be running the entire thing. And if I walk it all, like I'm, you know, like I'm not a runner at this race is um, gone belly up, like in the first couple miles. Right. So I think mentally, when we tell people in their strategy, like, Hey, this is, this is a great idea. This is what you're going to do. Um, it's easier to swallow at the beginning part of the race when you do feel good, when you do feel like, Oh, I don't need to walk, but I'm going to walk because I don't want to like, you know, blow up and then only be walking like the last, um, because we all know that like, you know, it's not the first 40 or even 50 miles of a hundred miler that, that make the ending. It's going to be like how you, how you feel going into the latter half of the race. So if you can do everything that you can to feel good going into the second half of the race, you put yourself miles ahead of everybody else. And like you ask anybody and the common notion is, is I wish I would have started easier because nothing is better than getting to the tail end of a 50 or the tail end of a hundred mile race, feeling like you have enough juice to give it a little kick. And now you're passing other people that made that critical error of going out too hard. So you're just building that positive momentum and positive momentum and not beating yourself up because you've been walking um, and you have good vibes throughout the entire race. And I think that's, that's key for like a solid finish. Absolutely. You know, I've talked about this before on the podcast. Um, it may sound a little uh, crazy, but you know, hitting 50 feeling fresh is key, you know, like getting there everything has come together for you. You're, you're keeping up on nutrition. You're keeping up on hydration. You're sticking to your training plan or your race day plan. It's, it's really sometimes hard to do, right? Because you go out there, you've had a great taper, you get to the start line and you know, you can, you can run way faster, but maybe not for a hundred miles. So you go out and you make that mistake and you start going a little bit too fast. And then that later on can get, get you, it's going to change how much you need for fueling and hydration. You know, all of those pieces are going to change based on if you follow your race day strategy, knowing what your pace should be, what your fueling um, needs to be, you increase that pace, you increase your heart rate, then you're going to need more fueling. You're going to need more hydration. You know, all of those variables change. So trying to stick to that the best you can is going to be key and getting you there, you know, to 50 feeling good so that you have that next 50 to break down. You know, I think when we're talking about mental piece too, is breaking down this hundred that's flat, right? Point to point. So you're, you're going for a hundred miles from one point to the other, right? And it's pretty, pretty straight. You're not going to see a lot of difference um, along the way thinking about how you're going to break that down. It could be, be maybe you're going to break it down by aid stations, right? And I'm going to get to this aid. Maybe there's 10 aid stations. I'm not sure how many aid stations are on the course, but you know, then we kind of could break it down by that. We could break it down by sec sections, you know, thinking of how you are going to get yourself through it. Any strategies on that mental piece of breaking that down? Because taking that whole hundred can be a little overwhelming when you first go and you're like, Oh, I got a hundred, I got one mile down 99 to go, you know, so you need to think about that. For sure. I think, you know, any strategy is going to be worthwhile 
except for looking at the mileage on your watch. Because although this is very like it's it's there's not a lot of buildings around to disrupt the GPS signal. There's not a lot of mountains around to bounce a signal around or canyons. Um, the GPS still is not going to be 100 percent at. Um, accurate. Um, you know, Garmin's GPS data is great. Koros's GPS data is great. Same with Sunto and same with anybody else that you're going to find. But still, over such a long difference, those very minute discrepancies in tracking um, add up to big distances overall. Um, last year when I was running the 50, uh, my watch said that I was at like mile 40 or something like that. And then I arrived to the aid station and it says like mile 38 aid station or something like that. And then you get into your head like, oh, but I thought I only had 10 miles left. And it can be slightly discouraging. So I think that like, you know, time or, you know, the great thing about this course is that like most of the aid stations towards like um, the end of the finish or at the end of the finish, but towards like the last half of the race, at least that I remember, are going to have your like a big sign that says distance to next aid station. So um, I think what would be a better strategy is, you know, going to an aid station while you're filling up. How far is the next aid station? Because most of your aid station volunteers are going to be able to answer that. And then no matter what your watch says, just look at it and say, okay, right now it says 38.1. And they're telling me that the, you know, the aid station is four miles up. So that means, okay, 42.1 is about when I should be coming in. So now if you're looking at your watch, you're not taking that 40 miles or so or whatever the watch reads as, as fact. You just take it as like a marker, you know? So now I can say, oh, I, I'm at 40 and I know at 42.1, the aid station is going to be there. Maybe I start to gather my trash, you know, or maybe I start to assess what I need. Um, so, um, yeah, I just think that um, as long as we don't take what the GPS says as absolute truth, we're okay. Because otherwise, you like we've all heard those stories about, you know, watches reading more than or watches reading less than. I think on my Strava, you can see that um, you know, I got like a 49.38 like, or something like that distance in total, um, which, you know, it, all of a sudden you're on the finish line and you're like, wait, what the heck? I haven't like hit 50 miles yet. Or you can hit the opposite problem where it's like, oh, I already hit 50 miles. Like where the heck is the finish? You know? So, um, I, I would say that's probably the only strategy I wouldn't use is just taking your, your GPS data as raw fact. Um, so I aid station idea is a great idea um, or even just keeping track of them in your head you know I know there's 15 aid stations and I've hit four of them so I'm roughly like a third of the way through right know? and that can be a, a fun way to kind of you know get through I think mentally I think talking about watches too so for me I really like to go more by rate of perceived exertion during a race and kind of like think not even think about my heart rate data um, so I don't even really look at that. Actually, I turn it off so that, I, that it's not something that's distracting me and I'm just going by effort. Um, and also I think it helps save battery. I, I, what do you do? Do you, are you using your heart rate or I think um, I'm so familiar? I'm, in. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of rate of perceived exertion. So I try to use those tools throughout the course of months to build this idea of like, how hard should I feel like I'm working? Um, yep. because of, it's always a shot in the dark of like, Hey, like we talked about before, is my um, is my watch syncing up with my cadence, or is it actually syncing up with my heart rate? It's if it's syncing up with my cadence, it might show I have 180 heart rate for six hours or whatever. Um, I think the thing with this race is that since the scenery isn't quite as distracting, um, because it is um, it, it is beautiful, but of course after hours and hours and hours of being on a canal, you're going to be like oh, it's the same canal, you know, it's the same type of trees, um, that I think if we do have distractions on our watch, um, it can, it can be fairly, fairly misleading. Um, so yeah, that's the only mental piece that, that I would have is just like, you know, try to tune into yourself, have these intrinsic ways that you can, um, provide yourself with some confidence and some motivation, whether that's, you know, positive affirmations of your effort, enjoying the process and reflecting on the people that helped you get there or reflecting on, um, the training that you liked, um, you know, in the past, in, in the previous buildup or external sources where it's like, maybe you're talking with somebody that's next to you and they're encouraging you and you're encouraging them and you're sharing stories, or maybe that's like appreciating the scenery or maybe like counting how many birds you see on the trail. Um, so I, I think those are a little bit better ways as opposed to looking at the watch and saying like, am I within these heart rate bounds? Am I at a certain mileage marker? Like, what is the overall time? Like, okay, now I have X amount of time to go. I think that can kind of, um, you know, lead to a little bit of 
like brace anxiety almost, you know, yeah. maybe you feel pretty well, but you realize that your heart rate looks high, but it's like, oh, well, I feel like I'm going pretty easy. Who knows? Maybe it's your, maybe it's your heart rate monitor acting up. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what do you, what do you think about that? I think it's kind of a touchy subject, you know? Yep. I can, com I completely agree with that. So I think we're right on the same page. So just go out there. I mean, my motto is just go out there and smile, relax and run, you know, just like get that smile on your face, let everything just kind of go and flow into place. You have put in the work, you're out there, enjoy the day, enjoy that whole journey because it's really incredible. Whatever distance that you are in, it's a big accomplishment. These are all ultra marathon distances. Um, another piece of advice I would say is make sure you double check the website to know all of the rules as far as, um, the uh, cutoff times and pacing, when you can have pay pacers, all of the rules on those pieces and where your crew, if you have a crew can meet you and where they cannot meet you because you don't want to get obviously get disqualified in a race like this. So, you know, make sure you know all of those rules and be respectful to those. Um, I think it's important to always double check, check those things. For my athletes, I also like to put together a little bit of a spreadsheet with all of the aid stations and GPS coordinates and um, sort of a pace guide. So they have an idea of about what time they might be hitting some of those aid stations um, within a certain time frame. you know, especially if they have crew that is going to be meeting them. For me, that was also helpful when I ran Hennepin as my first race was I had kind of looked at, okay, at about noon, I think I should be at this aid station. About 5 p.m. I should be at this aid station. Those gave me some targets in my head to know that I was, you know, within range of where I wanted to be. So I think that that's, you know, another strategy that you can use. Exactly. I think that's beautiful. And the nice thing about this course too, is that like all of the aid stations, um, to get to them, like usually you're just driving through a cornfield going 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, and you end up just pulling off like right next to the, right next to the, um, to the canal. And then boom, you're like right there. So there's no like hiking in, there's no hiking out. There's no making sure that like, you know, you're on, you're, you're not lost in the middle of the woods, you know? So it is a very, um, crew friendly type of race as well. Um, and all of the aid stations were just fantastic. I mean, I didn't run the entire like hundred mile distance. Um, my girlfriend ended up doing the 50 K, which is along the same route as the hundred. So like all of the aid stations that I saw her at were completely novel to me. Um, whether it's like making fresh food, um, oh, last year, somebody shared, like shared like a Danish, um, sweet treat that they homemade at the aid station from like their grandmother's recipe or something like that. So like you're going to find the best people at these races. You're going to find like, you know, the most encouraging people. So don't take that for granted. Like say hi to everybody, smile. Um, try not to be super crabby on the trail. I know things happen to everybody. Things happen to me. I've been crabby on the trail before and I feel terrible for it, but that's a good lesson to always try to have a smile on your face because positive energy given is positive energy received. Right. And remember that the aid station volunteers are there. They want to help you. So when you come into the aid station, if you're working to get it in and out quickly, don't be afraid to ask for help because that's what they want to do. They're ready to fill your bottles or give you the things that you need. So definitely ask for that as well. Good. And then well, another, I, another tip I want to throw out there is we do have a previous podcast that talks about, um, even or negative or positive splits, that's something that you could re-listen to. It might give you an idea of how you want to approach this race, especially, you know, some of the things I think about when I'm going into a race is what's the temperature going to be like at the beginning of the day? What's it going to be at the middle of the day? What's it going to be at the end of the day? Because I might be considering adjusting my pace according to that too, because that heat of the day makes it a little harder to be moving faster. So those, those are pieces you could think about, or is there rain in the forecast? What that might slow me down. I know when I get into the dark, it's going to slow me down a little bit so be thinking about all of those pieces too as you make your plan for your race day strategy absolutely i like that call back on our previous podcast <laughs> go back into the archives people there's some good That's stuff right. <laughs> there's gold in there <laughs> So I think, you know, we've done a pretty good job of putting this all together. I just want to throw out there, I do have a website, it's called ultracrazyrunner.com. And on there, I wrote a blog about my first 100 at Hennepin 100. It might help you give you some ideas, um, to some things to think about, and you'll kind of know what went on in my mind on that day as well. And there's a really fun video that my son did, did of me, and you'll get to see um, near the uh, uh, 10 Junk Miles aid station with the disco ball. And, and so that was really cool, too. Awesome. Is there anything else that you have, Loretta, or do you think we covered the race pretty sufficiently? I think we covered it pretty well. Do you have anything that you think we're missing? 
No, I just want to congratulate all the racers that line up um, on the day. Congratulations. You've made it. Um, you put in all the training. You put in all the hard work. Um, kick back during taper week. You know, um, get your runs done. Enjoy the process. Have fun. Congratulations to all OMR athletes that are going to be doing their first distance, uh, whatever it might be, 50, 150K. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, congratulations to everybody for sticking through it, um, through all the training, because that's the hardest part. So during the race, enjoy it, smile, have fun. Um, we only get so many of these good races per year. So it's definitely a treat to, to line up. I have one last thing. I just want to shout out to our sponsor, Gnarly Nutrition. That's what you're going to find on the race course. It's going to be Fuel 2.0. I believe lime flavor, if I'm right, but, you know, thinking about that. And if you're going to be using that, knowing how much you're going to be getting in at each age station is also a good thing to, to think about. And if you haven't tried gnarly feel too, oh, you might want to try it just to make sure it's going to settle on your stomach. If that's what you're going to choose to use. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for listening guys. We'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.